Welcome to the wonderful world of wine, exploring all things wine with you. We are your hosts, Kim Simone and Mark Lindsay, and you can find us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine. And welcome to this week's installment of the wonderful world of wine. I'm your host, Kim Simone. I am here with my co-host, Mark Lindsay. And how are you this week, Mark? Everything is great, Kim. Man, the year is going fast. I know. My goodness. Hey, the, the big day holidays are coming. So we're already gearing up for pairings for holidays and cheese classes and appetizers and what do you put with the main meal and what do you do with smaller parties and what are you going to give for gifts and all that good stuff. So I love the holidays <laughs> always. And it's such a treat to be in this business during the holiday season because people really do get very excited and really want to buy wine. So right. um, that always helps us out because we get to talk about it some more right. and sell some. It's a great gift. Always. It does. Indeed. So what's the first thing we want to talk about? Can so the first listeners? thing we want to talk about is something that really doesn't get a lot of conversation when we discuss wine tastings. And it is the concept of the flavor of bitterness. Now, you know, when we talk about wine, we always talk about acidity and we usually, you know, we'll talk about acidity versus sweetness versus the texture of the wine, but we tend to leave out saltiness and bitterness because they tend to be a little more underrepresented in the flavor profile of wine. So there are some wines that do have some bitterness to them. And we wanted to describe uh, how it gets there, what those wines might be, and um, you know how you can describe it. Have you ever described a wine as being bitter or have you used another term to describe bitter? So when I usually associate bitterness with a wine, it'll usually be in association with the tannins. So I'll usually use a word that is describing the particular characteristics of those tannins instead of just saying that it's bitter. Um, but when I've spoken to people and tasted wines with people, I will often find that people will equate bitterness and acidity. So the sour and the bitter kind of get, I don't want to say mixed up in people's minds, but they are they seem to be very closely tied to one another. And I don't really know why that is. I mean, it's a very different sensation, but I think that it's just maybe people are more used to using the word bitter than they are to using the word sour. And that's the word that, you know, comes out. And that's the word that has the association with food because cocoa powder that's not sweetened is bitter. Coffee is bitter. A lot of vegetables are bitter. So I think it's something that's more common in food than in wine, but it's part of the descriptive vocabulary for how people talk about what getting when they're eating something. So I think that that is a big part of it. That's a good comparison because in food, we often say bitter and in wine, we often say tannic. So mm -hmm. this is yeah. where- Yeah, so I think, you know, it's the I think it's the tannins. tannins. At least that's how I- And tannins to me is more mouthfeel, whereas bitter is more of a taste. So I don't taste tannins. I feel tannins. Mm -hmm. I taste bitterness. So yep. it can be rather, I guess, a, a, a tricky But I think it's thing, confusing but... if you don't know what to look for. Like if you don't know- what that the that sensation, sensation you're yeah. feeling is the tannin. So you you're grasping for a word that's going to describe what that is. And I think that bitter, bitter honestly is very apt. You know, if, if you're searching your memory banks for what does this remind me of? I think that makes sense because, and you know, back to the food thing, if you eat steamed spinach, just plain old steamed spinach, it's both bitter and tannic. So I think for a lot of things, people do that association where they put those two things together in their mind. And so it's like, ah, these must be the same things. So I, I do totally get that. I wanted to talk about you, you were saying early on about how it's not talked about a lot. And it's funny because there's only five basic tastes and bitters, one of them, and we never talk about it. No, really, we really don't. For wine. So, I mean, it's not like there's a million 
basic taste, right? Right. But bit is just not uh, brought up. Yeah, so not I, not often in wine. It is very interesting that that it's not. I mean, I think it is, but I think because we have so many other ways to describe it, we just right. don't use that particular word. You know, we use words that describe the tannins. Now, in the article, they were mentioning Kim that wines that are not floral or fruity tend to be bitter. Do you agree with that? Because you can have a fruity wine that has tannins. Yes. Right? And you can have a floral wine that is bitter. I'll also associate bitterness with higher alcohol, like me personally. So I know sometimes I've had Gewurztraminers that are like really high in alcohol, like 15% that are very floral, but that high alcohol hits my palate with bitterness. But not everybody associates it with that, you know, like that's my interpretation of it, but I don't think that that is typical for a lot of people. I think I'm a little bit of an outlier when it comes to that. So I would assume when you have something that's floral or fruity, you're getting that right away and then it finishes bitter. You you swallow it and you you get bitterness on the finish. Yeah. I think that's valid. I can see that. They did mention also that over time as a wine ages, that bitterness starts to dissipate Mm -hmm. due to either the process of oxidation or chemical reaction that's going on. Well, that would make sense if the, if the tannins are what's causing the bitterness. And then as the tannins coagulate and fall out of solution and they're removed, then that bitterness is removed along with it. And also mentioned, which you kind of hit on there, Kim, they say an unriped fruit Mm -hmm. can be perceived as bitter. And you get that in a cooler climate regions where the grapes don't fully ripen. So you might tend to get a little of that bitterness Mm -hmm. on the wine. And this might be where that bitterness, acidity, confusion can come from, because often these wines also have higher acidity because they're not as ripe, right? So if they're a little bit less ripe, their acid levels are going to be a little higher. But, you know, frankly, a lot of people find great pleasure in, you know, the sensation of bitterness. I mean, I'm certainly very happy with a nice little cup of espresso and there are plenty of other really good things to eat out there that have a fair bit of bitterness to them, but it is more of an acquired taste as far as humans go. You know, (laughs) babies don't like bitter. It is something that you have to, I think, experience a number of times in order to appreciate and get used to. Talking about food, Kim, let's, let's mention, you know, bitter wines or wines that you feel, what would they pair well with to offset maybe that bitterness? So the thing that I like to do is so we've we've spoken before about, you know, um, sweet wine sort of counteracts spicy food and sour and sweet. Those flavors go together. So bitterness and saltiness are that same type of pairing. So salt can negate bitterness and bitter things can make things taste less salty if they're overly salty. So I think that a wine that might have, you know, more of that kind of bitter characteristic to it goes great with some salty foods. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why dry sherry goes so ri- so well with like tapas things like either cheese or olives or little salty fish kind of things is because of the saltiness and then the bitterness of the wine. You put them together and they just play off each other really, really well. I like that's that not where you were expecting me to go, was it? No, I like that. because I was thinking <laughs> like a ham steak, something that ha- tends to be salty. Oh, yeah, food, totally. So, yeah, that it definitely works for me. Heck, and a where ham was, sandwich and where was <laughs> glass that of red wine. Wine from the white, you said, where was it from? Was it from a cooler climate, the one that you were sensing? Sherry? Floral? No, you, was, oh, you said yeah, um, about the Yeah, floral. like Alsa- like high yeah, so, alcohol, Alsatian. Yeah. So so it was it was cooler, yeah. Definitely cooler climate. Definitely cooler is, climate. Yeah. Lots of sunshine, but cooler. That's a good example. Yeah. Anything else on bitterness? Is, is there a way someone can train their palate to detect bitterness? Because you you mentioned, you know, cocoa powder, coffee, arugula. Is there wines that you could say, you want to taste that sensation, get this? I think that try some less fruity red wines. So, you know, stay away from your California Pinot Noirs. Stay away from your Zinfandels and your Shirazes. Try a less expensive bottle of red Bordeaux or dry something from the Piedmont region of Italy. You know, those are not super heavy wines, but they are wines that have very pronounced tannic structure. And I think it's a great way to understand what the texture is trying to tell you with 
the tannins coming across to your palate as bitter. So those are two that I would recommend for people. Yeah, I was I like the the Italian, the Nebbiolo grape, yeah. anything yep. Nebbiolo. And I, I was also thinking, can we talk about this a lot? It's kind of on our we don't really like it list, but the Pinotage. Oh. And I was thinking, yeah. you know, bitterness <laughs> might be why or something I get on Pinotage a lot. Do you detect that on Pinotage from the bitterness? South Africa? Yeah. I get no, for me, Pinotage no. is less of a texture and more of a flavor that I don't like, but it's absolutely a flavor thing and not a texture thing and not a bitterness thing for me. Yeah. It just, it tastes like somebody just repaved the street. <laughs> yeah. I get like blacktop. Band-Aids. Not pleasant <laughs> to me. Yeah. Yeah. We're still on that page. but I still haven't discovered one yet. There was one that Sandy Block gave me at Legal Seafoods. That was really delicious. And I really wish that I remembered what it was. I bet but it was it's a, prob- a lot of oak to kind um, of treat it. It must have been because it was like a richer, rounder style. It was definitely a full bodied, but it didn't have any of that funkiness that Pinotage usually has. I would have mistaken it for Shiraz probably. Well. But it was really good. And and now I really wish that I remembered what the wine was. Me too. But I don't. <laughs> Bummer. So bitterness. It's something bitterness. To about the basic tastes that uh, when you're tasting your wine, let us know if you come across one you think suits the bitterness. You're listening to The Wonderful World of Wine, and we are your hosts, Mark Lindsay and Kim Simone, exploring all things wine with you. We're here every week on Franklin Radio, WFPR 102.9 FM. For more information about Kim, please go to her website at commonwealthwineschool.com. For more information about myself, please go to franklinliquors.com. To send us questions and comments, please go to our Facebook page, The Wonderful World of Wine. Next, we have an article... That was in Wine and Peace. I like this name, Kim. Wine and Peace. Wine and Peace. Called Fruits of Labor. And this is something, Kim, I was kind of dying to ask you about. Do we think about how the fruit is being harvested before it's made into wine? The labor part of how this all happens. I think some people think about this more than others. But because wine is an agricultural product, you know, it is a fruit that has to be grown and harvested by somebody, that it's part of the bigger conversation of labor and agricultural labor and fair work practices and payment practices and migration and immigration. You know, it's part of it's part of that big story. And a lot of this came up recently during COVID where a lot of the workers physically picking not only wine grapes, but agricultural products like in California came from Mexico or other parts of the, the world mm-hmm. and they couldn't get here to, right. to do the, the labor to get things harvested. So there was a big issue. And then they also, once they were here, they, they have some very bad working conditions where they don't have the protection. They don't have uh, bathrooms to use when they're out there. They work in long hours. So there was a kind of a movement saying, you know, should there be something on the the label maybe or on the text sheet saying how it's happening? You know, hand harvest versus machine harvest, you know, who's doing the work? Do you you kind of think that should be something people should look into, Kim? I think it's something that people should be concerned about, but I don't know why wine should be specially pointed out as... Versus other... Versus, versus other, other agricultural produce products. and stuff, yeah. From a perspective of health to the workers, uh, just thinking about pesticide application and breathing all of those things in, um, you know, that is definitely something to, to think about when you think about do I want to purchase a product that maybe the growing of and the producing of doesn't provide for you know, helpful working conditions for the people who are doing it. But I don't think that there's anything about wine that necessarily makes it special or different from other from other products. Remember years ago, Kim, there was a term going around, MOTG, 
matter, uh, other, than matter other than grapes. So there was a big push saying that's you know, still the, around. Well, if, I don't know why it came out, but there was something saying, you know, the big brands, they're, they're using machine harvest equipment. So when they bring the machines in to harvest the grapes, they're just scooping up everything. In Frogs path, and bugs. Right? And and you think about it, it's probably true, but then they should kind of sort it out when it goes into the, to be made into wine. And I guess that wasn't happening as well. Or it was already too late because it was already mixed in with all the grapes. But doesn't this go back to a, a conversation that we had in an earlier show about transparency? I feel like this is part of that bigger question and that bigger problem. Do people who drink wine and enjoy wine even want to think about these things? And I think that they should think about these things, but I don't think a lot of people do because where is the the romance in your wine if you think that, you know, some frogs got in the tank too, you know? <laughs> right. There's, yeah. yeah. On the same point, if it's manually harvested and, and they're only paying the people, you know, a dollar an hour and you're paying $200 for the wine, right? I, I feel pretty You bad should be about concerned that. about that. And, and you should be concerned about your lettuce and your strawberries and your apples and your almonds too. Yeah. Yeah. It, they, but I know, they, but it is, and it, it's a subject and a topic that, you know, especially sort of in social justice circles and in people who talk about and study from an academic perspective, food and labor and equality and equal rights for laborers and things like that, that, that wine has always been, and wine grapes have always been one of those products that is always part of the conversation. And I think because it's a thing here, but it's a big thing in Europe about the use of migrant labors to pick the grapes, whether you're talking about Italy or France or Germany, you know, all of these countries use a migrant workforce to pick their grapes. And I remember a couple of years ago, it might've only been like two years ago, sort of this big sting operation in the South of Italy where these workers had been moved in from Eastern Europe, from Northern Africa, and were really sort of being kept in slave conditions and had no way to sort of escape this work situation that they found themselves in. And, you know, I think because of the, the migratory and seasonal nature of the product that it is an issue that has always existed and really should be addressed more. Yeah, they mentioned a lot of stuff about history. Europe, there was always things when the Greeks, the Romans, Bordeaux had a whole history of slave labor. And they also mentioned out in California, there was in the United States, I think in general, there was a Fair Labor, labor Act in like 1938 that not until like 2019 did California try to reverse it yeah. and make it more fair practice to, to people harvesting and doing all this manual labor. As I was reading this article, Kim, I was thinking to myself, a lot of things I look at on the text sheet is, is if something is hand harvested and we'll put that on like the cell sheet that, you know, this wine is only a thousand cases, blah, and all that fruit is manually harvested as a cell point. But now as I'm a positive, at it as, right? You know, because it, you know, yeah, we have this idea that hand harvested results in better quality wine, but then we don't turn around and think, well, whose hands are doing the harvesting? Right. And on that point, that's one of the things I wanted to ask you, Kim, about. Yeah. We always have this thing about manual is better quality. And do you feel that that is definitely something that's true in the wine world? I don't know. I mean, I don't. I don't With know all the that technology I could, of, you know, compare two glasses and say, oh, this one is definitely hand harvested yeah, because the quality yeah. is so much better. That's where you I know, was going. Cause, I don't I know mean, how much of a difference that that makes. Where we see, the, I think, I feel like where we see that more is where, because of the region that the grapes are grown in, you know, maybe it's someplace that is particularly hot and dry or very windy or, or whatnot, that grapes have to be trained in a certain way. And if they're trained in a certain way, then they can't be harvested by machines. So therefore, people have to pick them. So and it's not like a one-to-one -one that if people pick the grapes, the quality is going to be better. But it's also not saying that if a machine harvests it, that it's not going to be a good wine. So 
yeah, I don't necessarily feel like those machines are pretty intense mm -hmm. technology. You know, they they know they have sorters and they probably you know they're doing it faster so it could possibly keep the cost down. I mean, these labor forces. I mean, they have to pay. I, I remember watching a documentary about how the wineries in Napa they have their companies that do this picking for them, but they have to house them. It's just a, a tremendous cost mm -hmm. of, to the winery and most farmers of fruit or grapes are not harvesting it. They're, they're hiring outside people to do it. So I never really think about it though. And it's probably something when you talk about uh, sustainability and everything, we should think of that. And, and mm -hmm. in, for instance, South Africa, the fair trade, they you know promote that, that there's fair uh, trade practices going on with, with their production. So in the United States, I guess we really don't. Maybe, maybe is it part of sustainability if they're certified? Isn't that labor part of sustainability of a wine? I don't know, honestly. I, I thought I thought it was one of the things they look at labor force and yeah, you know, it might be. So it's not just environmental sustainability, but also the human factor as well. And one of the interesting things that was brought up too that I never thought of, Kim, and this was if the tech sheet or the or the winemaker is telling you, yeah, this is hand harvested fruit. It's not regulated, right? Right. So if a guy's driving a machine, isn't he? And he's hands are on the machine. It's it almost goes back to just recently in the liquor industry, there was distiller saying that it was handmade vodka mm -hmm. and was sued because you know his hands are never touching it. So <laughs> you know, so almost like. This when you can you say hand yeah. harvested? What is the definition of handmade, hand harvested? Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. not regulated. You know, you could say it's hand harvested, and mm -hmm. they can't do anything about it. So, anything else on the fruits of labor article, Kim? Just that I think that this is this is a a topic that I think we will be seeing more attention paid to, just as people are thinking more about the environmental impact of how we eat, what we eat, the human element of who is doing the growing, the picking, the cooking, the prepping, the shipping. I think that all of those things will, if they're not already in the forefront of people's minds, I, I think will start to be there a little bit more. Where do you think the labor thing falls or under category? Say, you know how we have like natural wine, organic wine. Mm -hmm. you, think it, you, you think it'll ever have a movement? Like that, maybe, maybe. I would think if they did something where they're working with an organization, or it might be a new niche in the wine mm -hmm. industry. But, like you said, I think you made a great point earlier, saying we don't, you know, there's all sorts of products that this is happening to out there, agricultural products, and it just raised some eyebrows, I guess. Yeah, yeah. When you study food, <laughs> this is not a new concept and not a new topic. It's been talked about for years, but I, I feel like. The, the greater wine consuming world is really only starting to think about this topic kind of right now. The other good point I wanted to mention, Kim, real quick was they mentioned we care about the terroir and where the grapes are coming from, but we don't care about the stewards of who's taking mm -hmm. this stuff from the land, you know, as much as where it's from, but not who's doing it for you. So. I thought that was an interesting point. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening today to The Wonderful World of Wine. We have been your hosts, Kim Simone and Mark Lindsay. You can find past episodes of our show on SoundCloud and iTunes. And as always, you can find us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine. Please leave us your questions and comments, and we would be happy to talk about them on the show. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.